Okay, so uh, welcome. And uh, first of all, uh, let's, uh, I hope you all had an uninventable uh, uh, spring break. It's a situation developing very fast and hopefully all of you are doing fine. So today I'm gonna talk about uh, this uh, uh, least square problem. And uh, interestingly, I downloaded some data from CDC and you can use, uh, you can see how to really apply this to a real application. Uh, I also uh, had a, like a survey in the form of a Google form and uh, uh, to ask you uh, whether you would like to get to the PNP and or, uh, no, sorry, or the letter grade. Uh, please answer that as soon as possible. Uh, just uh, want to get a quick update a uh, quick estimate of uh, the number of people taking each option. There might be more surveys coming regarding the actual form of the final exam, so stay tuned. Any question? Okay, so let's just, uh, let's say, consider the following problem. Uh, instead of a warm up, uh, I'm gonna do this, which is, uh, uh, so, Let's say we have two points in R2, and which are called x1, y1, and x2, y2. So let's say there are two points here. This is x, this is y. This is one point, x1, y1. And this is another point, x2, y2, okay? Uh, so I ask you to find a line passing these two points. Now, change down the color. So this is a, a, generally I can write this to be ax plus b. How do I do that? Uh, now we have learned that this is nothing but uh, a problem of solving uh, a linear system. So this is AX1 plus B equal to Y1 and uh, AX2 plus B equal to Y2. And we just uh, solve it and we find AB, right? So let me write this more specifically, uh, explicitly. So this is X1. And the second data is one. This is x2 and one. I form this matrix. So augmented matrix, y1, y2. And we solve this, the two unknowns are this a, b. So for any given two points, as long as these two points uh, uh, are not the same in R2, I can always find a unique line connecting the two. So this is what we are very familiar with. Now let's say that in uh, the real applications, it is uh, rarely the case that uh, you just have two data points and then draw a line. Actually, if you are only given two data points, ask you to draw a line and to predict something, it's very hard to say anything, right? So what is more likely is the following scenario. So you have all these points, you have this x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, x4, y4, so on and so forth. So this is, let's say, xk, yk. And now I ask you to draw a line, let's say here. And uh, even though you may have not taken any statistics or data science courses, uh, this is pretty intuitive idea. I mean, they're not exactly uh, on a line, but they are pretty close to a line. And uh, if we talk in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of systems of linear equations, so this is a set of you know, let's say there are n data points, and you need to do a x k plus b equal to y k for so all k from goes from one to n. Uh, so this is uh, really n uh, equations, but you only have two unknowns. Uh, equivalently, the corresponding augmented matrix takes the form x1 and 1 because b times 1, x2, 1, da, 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 all the way to xn, 1. 
y1 delta to yn. So obviously, we have way too many equations. So we just to solve it, most likely, uh, there will be a pivot uh, in the rightmost column. Uh, most likely, uh, uh, no solution. So if we're just uh, given this much information and uh, from chapter one to chapter four, you might say, okay, no solution, that's it. We'll move on to the next problem. Uh, but this is not really what we want in practice because for this given data set, obviously the red line makes more sense than let's say the green line, right? The green line would be say way off compared to the red one, but how do we really quantify this, uh, 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 this problem and say that we want to find the most plausible line that uh, goes through or uh, interpolate or try to approximate all these data points. So one possibility, so solving linear equations is not an option. So one possibility is to consider this alternative uh, problem. Instead of saying all of them should be zero, I consider a minimization problem so minimize with respect to unknown a, b, sum i from one to n, and this is a x i plus b minus y i squared. Uh, so this is a uh, optimization problem. So this optimization problem has a uh, very interesting structure uh, because obviously the objective function this is called FAB. Obviously, FAB is non negative because it's the sum of a bunch of non negative numbers. So, if FAB is actually zero, then it must mean that each of these terms is zero. Uh, i plus b equal to yi for any y i goes one to n. So uh, that means if we can really minimize to the absolutely to the global minimum, that is zero, uh, we have solved the linear system. Or saying that the linear system is solvable. In the case that this linear system is not solvable, then we want to find the a, b, which is a line, so that the difference uh, between all the data points and the line is actually as small as possible. In this, uh, uh, from this perspective, we can see that this red line indeed makes much more sense than the green line. So uh, let me see. So I saw that someone raised a hand. Can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Um, professor, I just want to know why do we have to square that in the minimization part? Um, if you don't square that, it's not non-negative. Okay, thank you. Right. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, so normally when I teach least squares, I'll just to give you some, uh, some example, but now um, we're all in this uh, COVID-19 business. Uh, so, uh, okay, so um, let me try to share with you this thing, uh, which is uh, uh, a Python notebook that I wrote uh, like uh, uh, last uh, weekend. So uh, what is this thing? Uh, so this is, uh, uh, last Sunday, which is September the 20th, uh, sorry, March the 22nd, uh, I downloaded the data from the CDC, uh, uh, which uh, give the results every day, updated daily. You can still download that. That would include the data for today, maybe later today. Uh, so at the time, the available data were from March the 4th to March the 22nd. Uh, I've used that as my training data. 
my goal was to predict how many patients uh, would be there, uh, confirmed the cases would be there yesterday or today uh, using the available data. Uh, so, which means that I must have a model. Uh, once I have trained the data uh, using the now uh, the, the modern language of machine learning, right? So you have now once you train the data, uh, you have some test data, which is the real number of confirmed cases today, uh, and we make some predictions. So uh, this was originally written uh, written by Professor Feng from a school of public health. In New York University, uh, written in R, because he was just is a statistician. I only adapted it to the Python version. And uh, last night, I added the real data from CDC till uh, 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 March the 29th. So uh, the, the the code is not important. Uh, so that's uh, not the focus of uh, this uh, uh, of this lecture. But I will upload uh, the notebook to the website, so that, as well as the data. So if you're interested, you can reproduce it. So uh, the x-axis is uh, the mar. Uh, uh, you can all see this, right? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, Hello? okay, uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, just someone told me, uh, tell me that that's good enough. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, the x-axis is the date, which is uh, March from 4th to 22nd. Y axis is the number of confirmed cases. So if you just plot this, which is called a linear plot, because you just plot the, the data as is, you will see that the number of cases uh, rise uh, very rapidly. Uh, but if you really ask me uh, what's going to be the number of patients uh, on March the 23rd or 24th, I, I really I don't have a model. I couldn't really uh, give you a prediction. So we know that from the epidemics model, the linear plot is not necessarily a good scale. The good scale is a log scale because it's a, uh, it grows exponentially. So I take a log of the y-axis. You can see that this is not exactly a straight line, but this is pretty close to a straight line. So now I want to do exactly the same problem I just talked about, but for the real data which is I want to find the A and B to uh, interpolate this line. So the method is called the method of least squares. That's what I said. I couldn't really solve why I equals to AXI plus B, but I goes to N train. But I want to minimize, choose A and B so that the discrepancy among all the tested training data uh, are minimized. Uh, so again, the code is not important. Uh, but it's actually very simple. Uh, there only contains three lines. Uh, the idea is you, you're going to form a new matrix. You're going to form a new right-hand side, and then you solve, uh, you do the real linear system solve for a two-by-two two problem. Uh, this is guaranteed to be solvable, and you get A and B. Why you do exactly these three lines uh, requires much more uh, 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 detailed explanation, which is going to be the central topic of this class and maybe part of the next class. But uh, the actual procedure is very, very simple. Uh, so you solve this, you get A and B, and uh, you plot how the fitting works. So you got the A and B. So this is A is this number, B is this number. You can see that this is indeed a very good uh, uh, thing. Some of them are a little bit above, some of the data points are a little bit below, but the overall, uh, it is intuitively conceivable, um, plausible that uh, uh, this line minimizes uh, the discrepancy. Uh, so uh, now we have a model because this is a line. I can now just extend this line to the future and then have a, uh, 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 this is, would be the log. I tend to the power of that would be the number of predicted number of uh, uh, patients. So this is what I did. So I go from, uh, uh, from the March of the 23rd to 30th, and I use this AX equals to B, and the number of cases predicted would be uh, uh, 10 uh, to the power of this number. So, uh, okay, so March of the 23rd was uh, 38, and uh, so all the way to today, it's an incredibly large number, which is 300,000. Uh, we, if you have been following this, you know that this is a quite an overestimation. 
and we're going to talk about that. So, um, so uh, okay, so so, uh, but the model as uh, I, uh, as much as uh, as much data as I had uh, last sun, uh, well, on March the twenty second, it shows that today there will be more than three hundred thousand confirmed cases. Uh, we want to know how much, uh, uh, whether this model is really trustworthy. So the following discussion is more for statistics. Uh, so it's not really for this class, but uh, in case you're interested, I include the code here as well uh, without using external packages. Uh, one thing is called the R square number. It tells you, uh, I mean, basically what it says is uh, uh, if this number is really close to one, means the linear fitting, the line fitting uh, is really good. Uh, so as you see from here, this is, a, I mean, the fitting is incredibly good. Indeed, you compute these numbers, tells you this is 0 0.998, which is really close to one, and says it's good. Uh, second is you can compute the so-called 95% confidence interval. Again, a uh, uh, concept from statistics. Uh, the number, uh, the, the code is not the point. And uh, that shows uh, till today, uh, let's say yesterday, the low, uh, lower bound with the 95% uh, 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 confidence that will be 200,000 and the high will be 260,000 and uh, okay so this is what I obtained the data uh, from the CDC last night and you can compare uh, uh, so the uh, the empty circles were the training data the field circles were what I obtained last night and you can see that the first uh, three days here the prediction was really really good and uh, the, uh, uh, after that, uh, uh, fortunately, the, the real data is, uh, uh, shows that the exponential curve is uh, being curved. And why is this so? And the reason is the exponential model uh, really, it, oh, sorry, uh, this is Zoom thing it needs to, uh, need to go back here. So, uh, so the real thing is that in this uh, uh, model, it assumes that uh, really nothing is done to uh, to curb uh, uh, curb the growth of the number of uh, confirmed cases. Uh, we know that in California, uh, the shelter in place order was enforced on uh, March the seventeenth, and uh, for the epicenter now, which is New York. It was enforced on March the 20th, uh, but uh, it's not like you just uh, issue uh, uh, shelter in place and immediately it will go down. Actually, quite to the contrary, uh, uh, the moment the shelter in place was informed, as you can see, for the next seven to uh, uh, 10 days or so, the exponential growth was just uh, really, really well, which means that it will take some time for this to be uh, become effective. And also, this uh, growth is probably related to that uh, there is uh, some uh, exponential growth of the capability of uh, uh, of, uh, of testing. But uh, after that, uh, seems like uh, hope. Uh, yeah, finally, this goes down a little bit. You will see uh, even more uh, accurately uh, uh, from the linear plot. So, in this linear plot, you can see that the actual number of cases yesterday was a little bit less than 150K, which is still very, very high. Uh, but uh, 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 fortunately, it was uh, significantly less than uh, that uh, predicted uh, using the data from March the 4th to March the 22nd. Any questions so far? Okay, so this was really used as a, I mean, real case study. Uh, uh, as I said, I will post this uh, online. There's a lot of information uh, in this uh, notebook and uh, which is beyond this lecture, so many for your interest. So uh, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, so the, uh, without, uh, without any intervention, probably this is just gonna grow as to the predicted, as, as demonstrated uh, for the data from the 23rd to the 25th. So, uh, how do we really get this line? This is really what we want to figure out. Uh, let me go back. 
go back to this one. Uh, in order to learn this, we need to uh, get a, a little bit of uh, preparation uh, and uh, define a bunch of things in order to understand how to get that equation uh, uh, definition. So if of a vector space, uh, so if there's a W, uh, is a subspace of a, in Rn, of an n-dimensional uh, vector space. So the subset in Rn that is orthogonal Hello? Uh, Hi, Professor. I think yeah. there's something wrong with your uh, microphone or something. Oh, many students can hear some noise. Okay. Uh, it is better. It is better? Hmm. I'm not sure. Hello? Hello? Yeah, it's yeah. better. Yeah. better. Okay, great. Okay, thick. So I'll just uh, not use the headphone there. Uh, one possibility is uh, my computer gets too hot. So uh, you're hearing the fan. I don't know how to solve that. Um, okay, so, uh, 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 okay. so uh, the subset in Rn that is orthogonal to W is defined to be W per which is equal to uh, V in Rn, such that the vector V is orthogonal to W for all W uh, in the subspace W, okay? So uh, let's recall that V perpendicular to W means that the inner product is zero. And uh, it seems like this is pretty uh, abstract, but it's actually very intuitive. The example is that, uh, let's say W is just a one dimensional thing. That is the span of one, zero, zero. And uh, which is W is really this line, right? So it's the span of one, zero, zero, this is the X axis. What is W perp? W perp is uh, a, 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 a set of all vectors that's orthogonal to this. And we take any vector that is uh, in the, so this is the x, y, z. Take any vector in the y, z plane. It is indeed orthogonal because uh, uh, this uh, W perp here is going to be the span of zero one zero and zero zero one. Each of them is orthogonal to this, and therefore the subspace is that, and uh, which is this y z plane. In particular, w perp is a subspace itself. Subspace is a two-dimensional subspace. Uh, uh, R3. Example one. So another example is that if we just consider the other situation, that is W, let's say this is our W, the YZ plane. So what is W perp? W perp is just a nothing but the X axis. So what we see here is that if I consider a subspace, I consider the perp and the perp again. So this is just a W itself. Any question? Okay, so, uh, uh, 
So more generally, uh, uh, we have uh, one W per is a subspace. And two is that uh, W, uh, uh, let's say if W is given by the span of W1 to WK, let's say RN. Uh, if you're hearing the noise, I'm sorry. So there are two things uh, I beyond my control. And the one is uh, the fan of my computer. The other is my restless song in the corridor. So, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so then what is the W perp? Uh, so W perp is uh, uh, V in Rn such that V is orthogonal uh, to each of the basis vectors of W, All right? So it's a, uh, this is how W perp is constructed. Uh, let's say we consider an example. So more con concrete example, A is this matrix, A is one, two, one, two. And uh, I know what is the column, it's column space. I want to find the column space of A per. So how do we do this? Uh, first, let's recall what's the column space. Uh, A is, uh, uh, has two columns. One is one, one, the other is two, two. And uh, the column space of A is defined to be the span of A1 and A2. These two are obviously linearly dependent. Therefore, this is the span of 1, 1. Okay. Now I want to find column A per, which means that I want to find, uh, uh, find the vector, which is called x1, x2, such that uh, 1, 1 times x1, x2 is 0. Uh, actually, I want to find the span of that. So the overall constant doesn't really matter. So one solution is x1, x2 equals to 1 minus 1. You can also have 2 minus 2 minus 3, 3 but uh, they just uh, differ by constant. And therefore, uh, this is the only possibility. So the column of A perp is span one minus one. Any question? Oh uh, yeah, question? Yeah. Um, were the first two like one, two numbered bullets criteria in order to, like were those criteria or characteristics? This one, two. Oh, these are some properties, sorry. Okay, I see. Um, is the uh, statement above that a property as well? Oh, right, right, yeah, sorry. Okay, uh, yeah, let, let's, let, let's just leave it there. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, so more generally, uh, let's see, uh, what are we talking about? So. Uh, more generally, if A is given by A1 to An, and I want to find column A perp, uh, then I want to solve, so uh, A1 dot x equals zero, da da da, An that x equals to zero, then x belongs to column of A perp, right? So let's rewrite this. So A1, A1 dot x, I can write it to be A1 viewed as a matrix transpose x, viewed this as a matrix vector, matrix matrix multiplication, da da da, an 
transpose x equals zero. But I can write this more compactly. This, the matrix A transpose x equals to zero. Because this is nothing, this thing is really written as A1 transpose, da, 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 AN transpose. Any questions? Okay, so if x, for any x that's in the column of A per, it solves this problem. Therefore, we have x is in the north space of A transpose. On the other hand, for any x, which is in the north space of A transpose, it will be orthogonal to all the columns of A. Therefore, x is in the column space of A transpose. This tells me a useful relation, which is the columns of A transpose uh, perpendicular is equal to the node space of A transpose. Hi, Professor. Just really quick. Um, is there any reason why you're writing the uh, the perpendicular sign outside the parentheses? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, very good question. The question is why the perp is outside the parentheses. So the reason is uh, perp of a matrix A is not well is not defined. We have only defined the perp of a subspace. So the perp of column space of A, column space of A is a subspace, and therefore the, uh, uh, the column space of A together, perp, is well defined. On the other hand, transpose is only defined for matrices. If I write north space of A transpose, is that's not well defined. So uh, you can only write north space of A transpose. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Any other question? Okay, so uh, this is to define the so-called orthogonal uh, subspace, which is very useful. Now let me introduce a useful theorem. It's called uniqueness of a projection. And the idea of the projection is really important for understanding the least squares. So let's say W in Rn is a subspace. Then any vector V in Rn has a unique decomposition. V is equal to W plus Z, where W belongs to the subspace and Z belongs to the perp. So the idea is that, let's say this is uh, uh, W, this is the origin, and uh, uh, ambient space is R3. I consider any vector V, okay? Uh, which obviously is not in the subspace. I can always define it in terms of uh, something W, which is in the subspace W, capital W, and uh, the other one, which is in the perp. And this is orthogonal. And you immediately realize that uh, this is W vector W is nothing but the projection of V to the subspace W. So the construction is very clear. Uh, so we're, all we need to show is this is the unique uh, possibility. So how do we show this? Uh, we only need to show uniqueness. 
So how do we show this is a unique decomposition? Suppose uniqueness does not hold. Which means that I have the decomposition V equal to uh, W plus C. This is one possibility. The other one is W prime plus Z prime. So we have W, w prime equals to subspace W and Z, Z prime equals to uh, this uh, W perp, right? So our goal is really to show that if we have two of such decompositions, then W must be equal to W prime and Z must be equal to Z prime. Uh, how do we show this? So we just move things from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. That is, I have W minus W prime plus Z minus Z prime, and this is equal to zero. Uh, so it seems like we have, uh, we have done nothing, but not really, because W is a sub subspace. Therefore, the vector W minus W prime is in the subspace W. Z is in W perp. Z prime is in W perp. W perp is a subspace. This is in W perp. So assume that, let's say, if both of them are zero, then we're good. If only one of them is zero, the other is not zero, that's not possible uh, because if, uh, let's say this is zero, this is not zero, but we have not zero equal to zero, so that's not possible. So the only thing we want to rule out is uh, neither of them is zero. But realize that if w minus w prime is not zero, z minus z prime is not zero, these two vectors are orthogonal because the one belongs to w, uh, one belongs to w perp, and then they are linearly linearly independent. So their addition cannot be zero because if the, uh, their addition were zero, it means that uh, if I solve a vector equation, x1 times w minus w prime plus y1 uh, times z minus z prime, at taking x1 equals to 1, y1 equals to 1, we solve the solution, and 1, 1 clearly is not a trivial solution. So, uh, contradiction. Therefore, we have the only possibility is w equal to w prime, z equal to z, z prime, and therefore uniqueness. Any question? Can you explain again why one of them can't be, I mean, just one of them can't be zero? If one, only one of them is zero, the other is non-zero, you just have non-zero equal to zero, right? I, I see, okay, thank you. Okay. Now let's uh, go to the main business, which is to uh, solve the least squares problem. So, uh, oh, I haven't defined what is the least squares problem. Uh, that was exactly the optimization problem I had before. One possibility. So this thing is called the least squares. Very intuitive, the least of the squares. Okay. So now I want to solve the least squares problem. So uh, uh, what does it mean? So we want to do ax equals to b, okay? Maybe it's because uh, I have way too many rows in the column, of, uh, in the matrix A, that the number of columns, or some other reason, that it has no solution. 
What does it mean? It kind of means the following. So AX, so AX, this is something, this is a vector in the column space of A. It's just a linearly combining the uh, uh, columns of A. And this one is the target vector, which is B. So column space of A, it generally forms a subspace in RM. So A is uh, M by N matrix. Then X is in Rn and B is in Rm. So in the subspace, in the vector space Rm, column space of A is a subspace up to dimension N. So, uh, so if B is in, this is the origin, if B exactly lies in the column space of A, we could possibly find a linear combination X such that AX equals to B. But if this M is way bigger than N, then this subspace is very small. If you just throw, throw an arbitrary vector B at me, it will likely be outside the column space of A. So a very natural idea uh, that it was not possible before I mean, uh, before we either we can solve it or not solve it because we don't have the idea of the geometry. We don't have the idea of distances or angles or, or lengths, so on and so forth. Now we have these uh, uh, concepts. Now we can indeed project the uh, B to some other vector. Let's call it B hat which is indeed in the column space of A. This is a projection, so this is a perpendicular. Now I can find AX equal to B hat. This is by definition solvable. where B hat is the projection of B to the column space of A. Let me say again why this is by definition solvable. At the beginning, we have a vector B that might be in a very high dimensional space. Let's say RM. M can be as large as you want. And let's say 10,000. Uh, N can be very small. Let's say two. That's exactly the problem we had before. You can measure for 10,000 times but you're only uh, asked to do a line fitting, which means you only have two parameters, A and B. So uh, you just uh, throw a random vector B, uh, vector B to me, uh, there's no solution. It means that this is outside the column space of A. Uh, so what I want to do is to project this vector to the column space because it's in the column space I can find a X, I mean, all the vectors in the column space of A can be written as the form AX, A times X. So there must exist at least a one X such that AX equals to B hat. If the, all the columns of A are linearly independent, uh, the solution is even unique. Is there any question? Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so if you have AX equal to zero in this case, would that mean that AX is in the null space? Ah, okay. So the question is if AX, the, the problem is AX equals zero, whether it means that we're solving the null space, that's a very good question. So if you are solving AX equals zero, it means that the B projected to the column space of A is just a zero. It means that your <laughs> Probably that means either from the line beating perspective would be your data is just a noise or, uh, or this, uh, 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 the A is too bad. 
but it is indeed possible that B is just orthogonal to the quantum space wave. Any other question? Okay, so uh, now let's say what is the least square? So least squares basically ask, the, ask us to do the following. We want to minimize x such that ax minus b squared, this is minimized. If you really write down, and uh, you can immediately see this is the case. You just write down component by component, and you will see why this is the case. So uh, so uh, uh, now, uh, how do I, uh, the only thing left for me to show is two things. It's quite important. I have to convert to the direction, and then you solve it, and A is not huge, and uh, you, you want to check, indeed, that the number of pivots equals to number of columns, so on and so forth. That, that's a complicated way of solving the problem. Uh, next, what I want to show is there is a, a very simple way of solving that. I mean, we have to continue in the next class. But uh, let me first state the useful theorem, which is called the best approximation theorem. So it's W. Is that space? Professor, it's yeah. uh, you're sort of there's a lot of static and we can't really hear you. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Hello. That's yeah. Yeah, Zoom shows that the audio is not that great. Uh, how about how about now? Is this better? Yeah, that's fine. That's better. It's better now. It, it okay. goes in and out. It might be better if you turn off the screen or the the video of your face, since there'll be oh, less okay. data. That's right. How about this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Probably next time I'll just uh, try not to do the video then, since not it's not that useful. Um, where would I? Ah, yeah. So W is a subspace and V is in Rn. So uh, by the uniqueness decomposition theorem, unique decomposition theorem, we have V equal to W plus Z. W is in the separate subspace W. Z is in the W perp. And uh, we also know that this W is nothing but in the projection from V to W, right? But why we know that? Because obviously W, this projection thing satisfies that by the uniqueness, this is the only possibility. Then, this is Z, which is the discrepancy, V minus the projection of V, which is the same as V minus the projection W of V is smaller than V smaller than or equal to minus W prime for any W prime equal to W. That is why it is the best approximation. So this is why it is the best approximation. Geometrically, this is really intuitive because, as I said, you just draw a V, and this is my W. You do a projection. This is the W, the W vector. And uh, here I have a, uh, 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 this relation. Then you just say, I pick some other W. Let's say W prime here. Then the difference between V and W prime is really this one. But you just, uh, I mean, I'm not a great drawer in 3D. So you can see uh, that this vector and this vector, they are actually perpendicular here. So the length of V minus W prime must be larger than or equal to this V minus W by Pythagoras theorem. So, uh, so geometrically, this is really clear. And what we need to do is to prove this. It's very simple. And we're going to 
postpone this to uh, the lecture on Wednesday. Any question? If not, uh, let's stop here.